See, that's what works. Prayer always works. And the Lord instructed us to pray without, that's right, so we can never stop praying. The enemy wants us to stop praying, but you have to make up your mind that you're not going to stop praying. I want to take a moment to welcome all those that are online. Thank you for being here. Okay. We're going to go back first to, um, I want to finish up part one of a tale of three kings. Now, I want to encourage all you that are watching online and you that are at home and you all can pass this where we stood out really good. Everybody was really into it. And then we began to fall off. We're getting better, I think, even to a more powerful of this teach, which is the second half of the book. So I want to encourage everyone to get back on the bicycle. Get back in here in this room with me as we get to really dig this next part two of A Tale of Three Kings. So I want to teach from here for a moment to conclude um, part one. And then I want to jump over to some of the teaching I was doing on Sunday about Goshen. Because I believe, I believe it's a prophetic word to the Lord for this body. So I want to go back to book. We did chapter 17. We really did. But we're going to read through 17 quickly and go on to 18. So I'm not going to do a lot of interruption. We have our um, superlative reader with us. We'll be reading, and then we're going to go over to 18. I'll be breaking 18 down. Look at somebody say, A Tale of Three Kings. Now, actually, your neighbor say, Which king are you? That is what we should all be asking ourselves. Which king are we? What are your characteristics? If God chose you for the king tomorrow, which king would you be like? Would you be, look at somebody say, are you Saul? Are you David? Are you Epsilon? Or are you all three of them? Time will tell. Yes, it will. So let's go to chapter 17, and can you please read? Two generations after the reign of Saul, a young man enthusiastically enrolled himself into the ranks of Israel's army under a new king, the grandson of David. He soon began hearing tales of David's mighty men of valor. He set out to discover if one of those mighty men might still be alive, and if so, to find him and talk to him, though he calculated that such a man would be over a hundred years in age. At last he discovered that sure enough, one such man still lived. Having learned of his whereabouts, the youth hastened to his dwelling. Anxiously, if not hesitantly, he knocked on the door. Slowly it opened. There stood a giant of a man, gray, no, white-haired, and wrinkled beyond expectation. Are you, sir, one of David's mighty men of long ago? one of those men of whom we have heard so much? For a long moment, the old man surveyed the young man's face, his features, his uniform. Then in an ancient but firm voice, he replied, never taking his steady gaze off the young man's face. If you are asking if I'm a former thief and cave dweller and one who followed a sobbing hysterical fugitive, then yes. I was one of the mighty men of David. So pause one second. So how many know perspective is important? You know, when somebody has been out there and they've done great things, in the moment, it doesn't look so great. And so he says, are oh, you one of David's mighty men of valor? But when he gives um, the insight to who he was and who David was, does it sound like they were mighty men of anything? Does it sound like David was some incredible leader? He said, if you're asking if I am a former thief and cave dweller, that doesn't sound like a mighty man of valor. And one who followed what? A great king? No, a sobbing, historical 
fugitive, then yes, I was one of the mighty men of David. Tell you never say it's all about how you look at it. And watch this. And you don't have enough perspective to look at where you are now. And we're going to even look at this when we talk, go back to Goshen. These really stories really tie in very well. So sometimes your perspective on where you are now might be very negative. But in actuality, they might be very great. We just have to finish the story. Touch your name say, we got to finish the story. I ain't talking about this story. I'm talking about your story. Read. He straightened his shoulders with, the, with those last words. Nonetheless, his sentence ended in a chuckle. But sir, you make the great king sound like a weakling. Was he not the greatest of all rulers? He was no weakling, said the old man. Then sizing up the motivation for the eager young man's presence at his door, he replied wisely and softly, nor was he a great leader. Oh, wait, let's do it again. He was no weakling, said the old man. Then sizing up the motivation for the eager young man's presence at his door, he replied wisely and softly, nor was he a great leader. So let me ask you, so what was he then? Read it again. He was no weakling. Okay, he, so he's no weakling. So what does a weakling speak to? No, if somebody is a weakling, what is, if somebody said you're a weakling, what does that speak to? Your strength, right? Your strength. A weakling means you have no strength. So, so he says, he was no weakling. Go ahead. What does it say then? Said the old man. Then sizing up the motivation for the eager young man's presence at his door, he replied wisely and softly, nor was he a great leader. So he was natural. He says, he's, you know, he was, well, he's kind of strong, but he wasn't a good leader. You know, perspective <clears throat> of the moment is everything, and I really do understand this. Uh, let me use a demonstration. Corey, can you hear me? Or oh, who's in the booth? Who's in the booth? That's, um, hi. Ife. Ife. Go in that room and look, and look on the top shelf, and bring me one of those trophies up there. Yeah, in that room. Now, when you're a leader, sometimes... You have times where you will question your leadership, even as a leader. I tell you many times my father was instructed of God to do certain things, and he was questioned, well, why are we doing this? And one of the hardest answers was to give, I don't know why. I'm just doing what God said. So somebody could think, what do you mean you don't know why? Sometimes you just got to hear God and trust God because our entire walk is a walk of faith. Put it on this side right here. Right, okay. Facing the audience. So in my days, I was a coach. Everybody say coach. I coached little league baseball, intermediate baseball, high school baseball, and college baseball. I was a coach. The job of a coach is to coach. Now, what makes a coach a good coach is what? Okay, you said, let's say that again because I want to get this. Is, what did you say, Sister Brown? Okay, all right, very good. My dedication to the players, yes. What did you say, Lita? Okay, consistency. I thought you were making reference to also the player being able to adhere to the coach. Okay, the ability for them to listen. You're right, so there's discipline on both sides. The coach has got to be disciplined to be patient with the players, why the players must be patient to trust the coach. So when I started the year, I think this was high school players, I did not have that. I had about 12 young men, mostly Caucasian. I think my son was the only African-American boy that was on the team. And we were playing high school. This was, I think this was Connie Mack, it was called. 
I think I was the only black coach in the organization. So this was the championship co co um, trophy. It was a championship. Yeah. Means we won it all. We won it all because they believed in the coach. Now, does that mean I won every game? Came pretty close to one year. I think we started out almost like eight wins and no losses. But eventually we had a loss. Now, it took me time to put a good team together. And then I only had to put a good team together. I had to get the team to mix together. Because you have to work together. Baseball, you have how many players play baseball on a, on a team? Uh huh. So we don't have no baseball players up in here. <laughs> nine. It's also my nine players. And so you have to have, you got a catcher, a pitcher, first base, second base, shortstop, third base, right fielder, left fielder, center field. Nine players. And they must play as one. You often hear a house divided against itself, what? It falls apart. So you have to believe in the people that are on your team. You have to cheer them on when they're not doing well. But their ability to listen and to work hard. Everybody say work hard. So these young men, we, we probably had practice two or three times a week, a lot more than most teams did. I had one, one of the parents when he hit ground ball. So on a weekday practice, they may get, 50, 60, 70 ground balls over and over. It almost seemed mundane. Like, how many more salt ground balls do I need? Now, there's a scripture in the Bible that would seem mundane. He said, meditate on the word how often? That might seem mundane every day, every night. But they say do it, they want you to do it day and night because they realize there's a time when you're going to be challenged. And how many know the hardest thing is not when everything is easy? It's when the challenge comes. You know, for the boxers, when you get knocked down on your butt and you're on the mat and they're going, one, two, do you have enough within you to get back off that mat and go back and fight again? It's, it's always when it's difficult, not when it's easy. So you do it over and over again for that. It's like basketball players. That one famous coach said, he makes them shoot like a thousand um, Three, four, three free throw throws um, a week. Coach, that's, that's ridiculous. I mean, I, I was at the top in high school. So I'm not worried about the regular game. I'm worried about when we get to the championship and there's only two seconds on the clock and the pressure is built. And now I need you not to miss because of the pressure. How many of y'all know the devil know how to put pressure on you? And when the pressure, and they all say, the pastor boys say, when you get squeezed, what's going to come out of you? That's right. When the devil squeezes you under temptation, under pressure, under trials, under temptation, what comes out of you is whatever is in you. That's why I told you to meditate on the word. How often? So the only thing that will come out of you is the word of God. Some folks, when they get squeezed, they cuss. Tell you off. Want to fight you. Because they never got all that bad stuff out of them. But when you got nothing but God in you, only God can come out of you. So when Saul threw the spear, David picked up the spear and threw it back. No. Because he didn't have Saul in him. He had God in him. And the God in him said, we don't throw spears. You can throw a spear at me. That's why I said, bless them to do what? Opposing. So the coach says, I want you to bless the person that's cursing you. Or he says, How about this one? If you smack me on one face, side of my face, what should I do? How many of you feel like you're there right now? <laughs> Y'all look at me. I, I don't get, I'm not getting this. I'm getting this. Can, can, can you turn the other cheek and say, Here's the other cheek for you to smack? Or do you say, let me smack them back? Y'all looking at the sideways, roundabout. I can't get no eye, can't, no eye contact. But if you're going to be on the winning team, then you've got to listen to the coach. This didn't come because it was easy. It came because they listened 
and they worked, and they worked, and they worked. I know Swatch out there now. Let's give Swatch a big hand. We appreciate what Swatch doing, <laughs> prayers doing. Now, in my mind, because I understand teamwork and I understand process, I think Swatch's been out like three or four times now in this neighborhood, right? More than four times? I know, I know you've been out for a while, but I counted it as a couple of rain days and a couple of cold days. and So I think it's like four or five times. I mean, over here. I'm not talking about something. I'm only talking about over here. Okay. So in my heart of hearts, I wish they went out five times and now I had 500 more members. But that's not realistic. Because the Bible says, one does what? Plant. Another does what? Water. At the end of the day, who brings the increase? God. So you have to be patient. The scripture said, and he added to the church as such should be saved. So some people are now all the seeds you planted, somebody else is watering those seeds. So you have to keep the team encouraged. You know, you know, you know, you walk in here on a Sunday. I don't see that I heard you praying for some people. I don't know if any of those people have been in the service yet. Have any of them been? No. They're right. They're not yet, but you're confident. And that's the same confidence you as a leader have to spread to everybody else. We got to stay there. They're coming. Folks are getting delivered. Life is changing. I saw Jackie this past. Okay, well, that's, that's awesome. You would hope that he got saved and suddenly he was there, but he wasn't. But that's okay. Oh, we were praying. And then this past 5 a.m. in the morning, Sister Jackie came in. The, the, the internet wasn't working. The mics weren't working. We had a doubt. But then Jackie didn't turn around and say, all right, Pastor, I'm going home. Then the kid wasn't what was working. They were still on the altar because you understand it takes a process. It takes time. And you must be confident of the call, confident of the assignment. So tell, tell, you, tell your name and say, we're on a winning team because we got a good coach. That, right, that means you got to listen now. Okay, go ahead. Read. Then what, good sir? For I have come to learn the ways of the great king and his uh, mighty men. What was the greatness of David? I see you have the, ambition, the ambitions typical of youth, said the old warrior. What, what, what are the ambitions of youth? They want to be great. Yeah, but all right, but how, do, how do they perceive to get greatness? When you deal with young people and being successful or achieving goals, what's their mindset? Huh? To win, but how to win? How, how, how do they think one should win? What'd you say? Quickly. Quickly. There you go. They want no, no process. They want to wake up in the morning, step out of the bed, and I'm a winner. They want to go to one, one, one grade in school, go to third grade to be a millionaire. They don't want to talk about no elementary school, junior high school, high school, college. Talk about getting a master's, getting a doctor. Oh, that's too much. So here it is. He sees this old man, but his perspective is greatness came for David and then really quick. Pastor Boy said, You see my glory? You don't know the story. How many of y'all got a story to tell? Boy, he said, boy, Pastor, boy, I can tell you some stories. You see me here today, but you don't know the craziness that went on before I got here. So how, how many of y'all had some craziness this week? Oh, I'll testify craziness this week. That's right. Pastor said this was a month of craziness. Okay, read. Hey, can you do me a favor? Can you slide that over a little bit? Well, because I can't see my reader, okay. Thank you, Rita. In the book, they call you the recorder. <laughs> Read. I see you have the ambitions typical of youth. Youth. Said the old warrior. I have the distinct notion you dream of leading men yourself one day. He paused, then continued reflectively. Yes, I'll tell you of, of the greatness of my king but the words may surprise you. 
The old man's eyes filled with tears as he thought first of David and then of the foolish new king only recently crowned. I will tell you of my king and his greatness. My king never threatened me as yours does. Your new king has begun his reign with laws, rules, regulations, and fear. The clearest memory I have of my king when he lived in the caves is that his was a life of submission. Yes, David showed me submission, not so, authority. Okay, so, so he showed him submission. Submission to who? To God. That's why I always tell people. I'm not worried about you being a good, a good member. If you're good to God, you'll be good to your pastor. Because being good to God means you're following what the word of God says. So we have to find out David was done by a demonstration. Our lives must be a demonstration of our relationship with God. Talk is cheap. Showing up at 5 a.m. in the morning, that's something different. Talk is cheap, but going out there every Saturday and, and witnessing is different. I can talk about doing it, but who's doing it? It is showing the work, because faith without works, the doing is dead. You must be a doer of the word and not just a hearer of the word. Everybody can hear, but what do you do? The disciples had to be doers. And so that's what we are. We're doing. So he's saying here, these men were doers. They, they, they were Doing, but he was doing what God and that's not what we want to do. Is what God wants to do. Jesus did not want to die on the cross. We ring a bell. Ding, 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 ding. He said, "Father, is there some other way?" But if not, not my will. Here we go. Your will. And so here's the ultimate submission. Can I be submission submitted to the will of God? Let me get wave your hands and say, "Pastor, I'm going to submit to the will of God." Ooh, that was dangerous, y'all out there. Ooh. You know, when you when you wave with God like that, he's go, okay, good. I'll do it. Well, look out what's coming tomorrow. <laughs> can you submit to not your will? Because our will can get you. The Bible says there's a way that seemeth what? Right. All right, so there's a will that seemeth right unto man, but the end of his will is what? Death, destruction. Read. Yes, David showed me submission, not authority. He taught me not the quick cure of rules and laws, but the art of patience. Now, wait a minute. What is the quick, what's the word, quick what? Cure. Cure of? Rules and laws. Of rules and laws. No, 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 no. He, they, he said he showed the patient. He said, but many people think the way to lead is rules and laws. So, so you, you, we need to get this. What is the what is a cure? Say what? He made something good. Well, you, you we can like when we usually hear the word cure, we 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 put in what mindset? Sick, right? You something sick, and you want to need to make it well. So he said the way to make something well or to cure the bad is to do it what? Have rules and laws. But he said, but David wasn't a man of rules and laws. He was a man of so why in leadership does patience in this context overrule rules and laws? Okay. When you lead people, if you've ever done any leadership role at all, especially in ministry, how many know you need a lot of patience? Now, you can make rules and laws saying, we're doing this, we're doing this way, you don't show up, you're out. Rules and laws. Or you can say, let me explain to you why. Let me have patience. And some people, I mean, some people need more patience than others. So I say to you, it's necessary for you to be at Wednesday night service so you can grow but I look around. At first we started, I think we had 50 people on Wednesday night when I started this book. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. We got 15 tonight. There's about 30 folks missing. So I heard the word earlier, consistency. That's what I said. This one because they were consistent. They were there on Tuesday nights, Wednesday night. They did their homework. They came out and they practiced for two or three hours 
And at the end, that's what allowed us to be winners. Pastor Boyd used to say, come to church on Sunday morning, Wednesday night, Friday night. That was mandatory. Everybody say mandatory. mandatory. And you still have people who didn't do what was right. I still have people who complained about being in church three times. That's too much. At that time, they might have thought he was crazy. Now he's one of the greatest leaders ever. Oh, he's a great apostle. Why? In, in retrospect. <laughs> Read. That is what changed my life. Legalism is nothing but a leader's way of avoiding suffering. Or what, what, what would be the suffering? Legalism, which is meaning rules and laws, is an easy way for a leader... Read it again in context one more time. Legalism is nothing but a leader's way of avoiding suffering. So what, what is the suffering that you have to avoid when you, use, when you don't use legalism? Patience. Patience. The trying of your faith worketh what? The test. And when, and when what has perfect work? And when patience has had its perfect work. Then you become changed. You get transferred. You get transformed from what to what? You, you become whole, complete, wanting nothing. And so you have to have the ability to hang in there with people. Jesus had 12. He had to do a lot of hanging in. You're, in fact, if you go back and read some of the scriptures, and tell you, you heard he was, frustra- he was frustrated. What did he used to say a couple, a couple of times? What did he say to his disciples? Yeah, how much longer must I be with you? How about what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, 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 who am I? How about when he was on the boat? You remember what he said to them? Okay, <laughs> we got little dips and dabs all over the place. But later on, like, really? So you guys really thought we were gonna drown, huh? He was, all right, how about, the, how about the boy with the demons? Well, why couldn't we do it? You faithless generation. How, then it was like, how much long? What more does it take? Yeah, how much, how much, how long? Well, y'all think this is going to be like six or ten years? Ain't, I mean, I'm about to get out of here. So you have to make a real effort and you can become extremely frustrated. And now on top of that, then they all said, Peter said, and definitely Peter, Peter said, I will never do what? I'll never leave you, Jesus. I don't care what happened. I'm your road dog. I'm dead. I'm with you to the end. Jesus looked at him and shook his head. Peter, Peter, Peter. Before the cock crow thrice, you'll deny me. Not me. Wow. So even people you depend on can let you down, but your, your job is still to stay there with them. That's the hard part. Right? You put it in God, but you still have to deal with the men. <laughs> Read. Rules were invented by elders so they could get to bed early. Yeah. Men who speak endlessly on authority only prove they have none. And kings who make speeches about submission only betray twin fears in their hearts. They are not certain they are really true leaders sent of God. And they live in mortal fear of a rebellion. My so, king spoke not of okay, my king spoke not of God. Submitting to him. He feared no rebellion because he did not mind if he was dethroned. Now wow, that's really the, a place to come to. I don't know, in all honesty, in good old America, how many pastors would care if their church took them down off the pulpit and have no fight. What's your justification? 
That's why when we move into part two, we come to a real, to find out what's really in you. Look at somebody say, what's in you? Because here's the controversy. No matter what man attempts to do with you, the one thing that you must realize is what? They can do no more than God allows. That ultimately, who's the only person in control? God. And truth be told, he's the only one that takes you down. Because if God don't want nobody to take you down, guess what? You ain't coming down, which we're going to find out. What, what, did Saul want to get rid of David? Absolutely. And he went to the extremes to get it done. The whole army, dogs, himself, he spared nothing to make sure David was going to die. And David was with the opportunity to kill his probably greatest nemesis, his greatest enemy. Here's a guy who's out there trying to kill him. Now you can kill him, as Joab said, and free us, David. You had his own spear right at him, and you did what? Nothing. And David's response is, I will not touch God's anointed. Which means not that you trust Saul, that ultimately you trust God. Ask somebody, can you trust God that much? See, that, that's the whole thing of this teach. What is your level of trust? When it seems apparent in the natural, you're about to get wiped out. Done. And the only person that can keep that from happening to you is God. Can you trust God to that point? We talk about Joseph, and we, we, we talk about Goshen. It was whose job to kill Joseph? His brothers. He had made up his mind, his brothers, we are going to kill Joseph. They had him in a pit. Right? They were jealous of him. The whole stage is set. But who's in control? Tell you, let me say, you would be dead. Look at somebody tell me, you would be dead. The only thing that has kept you here is the des no, your destiny in God. Everyone in this room has a divine destiny. There is no reason why I should not have been either shot, died of a heart attack, or a car accident. Three times, sort of shotgun. The nine millimeter at my head, 45 at my window, that's enough to get shot at. And never did the gun go off. Two heart attacks, one in the pulpit, one when I drove myself to the hospital with two clogged arteries, 95% clogged. Oh, it, it really is God. Or the times as we were talking about me driving home when I was doing cantatas here from this church all the way to New Jersey, which took me over an hour, and how many times I got home and didn't even know how I got home. All I knew when I, when I came to myself, I was sitting in my driveway. And I tell you what, all honestly, and I will find out when I get to heaven, I've got to believe with all my heart, there were nights that the, that the angels drove me home. I, I was literally driving down the Garden State Parkway with my window all the way down, with my head out the window driving, just doing that, hey, stay awake, wake up, John. just yelling because I was about to go to sleep. And I was trying to get home. I know that, that, of course, I should have just pulled over and went to sleep. I didn't do that. God has mercy on fools, okay? So I should have pulled over and just went to sleep, and I wanted to get home to my family. And so you fight, oh, I'm going to be out, and then it doesn't happen. And so I cannot tell you how many times I, pull, I, I woke up in, my, in the driveway like, how did I even get here? But the mercy, right, my, there's no question. I, had, I, I got some kind of destiny in God, okay? Some kind of destiny has been reserved for me in God. And I'm grateful. That's why I take no credit for anything. I, I'm thankful all the time of how good. 
And evidently, I had to be here for you. Amen? Praise God. Okay. So I can teach you the tale of three kings. Okay. Let's read. David taught me losing, not winning. Get Wait. He taught me what? Losing. Whoa. He didn't teach me this. He taught me losing. How many know there's a power in losing when you lose right? Right. You just be saying, say, don't be what kind of loser? Don't be a sore loser. Pastor Boy said, when you lose, he asked you the question. Did you learn the lesson? When you lose, the ultimate thing is that, why did I lose? What did I do wrong? What do I have to correct? So before I became a winning coach, I was first what? A losing coach. I lost plenty of times, but learned the lesson every time. So I knew how to develop a team that could win. Uh, my understanding is Golden State just lost. Is that right? Somebody? You know, anybody in the basketball? <laughs> I think they were in the playoffs. I think they just lost. They were saying like they had won like four championships and now finally they lost. And they said, we've had a great run. We, we've done well for a while. But you have to know that sometimes in life you're not going to win every battle. At the end, you want to win the war, though. My father used to say, John, sometimes you got to lose the battle if you're going to win the war. Sometimes you can't every time because there's something in here for you to learn. And God wants to teach you that process. As great as David was, there became a time where he had not learned the lesson. Because the scripture said when men should be, when kings should be at war, David was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And people don't even realize, even now, there are people who are at home that shouldn't be here. If they were here, it would be saving them from something they don't even realize they're getting into. Read. He showed me that the leader, not the follower, is inconvenienced. Who gets inconvenienced? The leader. That's what people don't understand about leadership, real leadership. You're the one inconvenienced. You don't want to have to do the extra if you're going to lead. Because you must lead how? By example, I can't make demands on you that I don't put on my own self. That's an improper way of leading. I can't demand Jackie or Sister Ennis to be here at 5 a.m. prayer if I'm not here my own self. I can't tell you to go pick up somebody if I'm not willing to take my own car and go pick up somebody else. That, and again, it's not because I feel like it. Sometimes you don't feel like it. Ministry is not about feelings. <laughs> How many of y'all get an amen? To, and ministry is not about feelings. And many times you don't feel like doing no, I don't feel like it. Sometimes you want to be selfish. You just want to think about yourself. But you can't. Because ministry is people with all their issues. You know, you know, and it's frustrating. You know, sometimes even, you know, uh, how many of y'all enjoyed Prophet Jones on Sunday? Oh, he was... You know, and... Uh, I, now, he was really helping a pastor on Sunday. I, that was a pastor's message. And when he, when he started talking about being mature and you still fighting over chairs, I could have fell out. I could have just laid out on the floor. Because I still got people who just, I'm going like, really? How many times have I walked in? Some of y'all are guilty. And I say, sit in the brown chairs. And y'all walk in, go right to the, in the back. I'm like, why do y'all do that? When I was in the church, I used to, I used to have a say. What was the say? Y'all remember my saying in the, in the chair? If blue is in front of you, then you don't move up. There can be four rows of blues in front of folks. They said, but I'm, look, I'm looking like, God, this can't be right. And every time I said that, all I could think about was Moses. Poor Moses. He had millions. I, 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 I got a couple hundred. In there. And I'm going through this now. I, I think Moses, Moses hit, a, hit, hit, a, hit a rock. I think, I'm surprised he didn't hit somebody. <laughs> Uh, I'm surprised most of the around just beating them all up. Amen. Read. David shielded us from suffering. Wow. He Sometimes leaders shield you. How many of you, all mothers, wave your hand. Mothers, wave your hand. Mothers, okay. Mothers, how many times have you shielded your children from trouble? 
How many have you taken the suffering that they should have taken? How many of you wish you had to beat them? <laughs> yes! <laughs> but, you know, even that, sometimes you say, wow, man. And the bad part is that after you do that for a lot of people, guess what? They don't even appreciate it. Is that the most hurtful thing? Yeah. You buy your kid $100 a pair of sneakers, they go, you don't never buy me nothing. Boy, I'll snot you tonight. That's not on your nose. <laughs> you don't never take me nowhere. You just came back from vacation. Yeah, I'm hungry, man. I'm so bored. What do you mean? Bored what? You, you, got, what, what are, you got all them dead. What do you call them games? You got every PlayStation. You got five there going TV in your own room. When I grew up, you had, there was one TV in the living room. Everybody watched the same TV. You, you got your own personal TV, your own personal game station. You got your own DD, DV players. Your own, you, got, you got a laptop. You got an iPad. Your own room. And I was going, you know, you had two or three people in the same room. One bathroom, waiting in line to get in and wash up. Now you got your own bear from it. You still come Because they don't know what they have. And here again, I always say, when you don't know the value of what you got, what do you do? You abuse it. Mentally, you abuse it. Your mouth abuses it. Ooh, and that's when you really got to pray. Right, parents? Yes, God, you got to pray. Grandparents got to pray. Read. David shielded us from suffering. He did not meet it out. He taught me that authority yields to rebellion, especially when that rebellion is nothing more dangerous than immaturity or perhaps stupidity. So you get that? He's saying the reason people rebel is their lack of maturity. So someone who doesn't want to, when I say, can you move up and sit in your chair, you sit there, says to me, you're what? You're immature. Now, you know, but you, uh, what'd you say? Okay. <laughs> you know, you're immature. You, you, you're, that's why I always say you're a baby. That's what Prophet John would say. Well, you're just a baby. Grow up. You, 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 you're still on milk. You know, I, I got to come bring you a pack. I, I need to get some giant pacifiers. And when you all act up, just walk over to the pacifier and say, here's your pacifier. <laughs> Ministry, again, is not making you feel comfortable. Everybody feels I feel comfortable. I don't like to sit in this row. I want to sit by that person. I don't, I don't like to sit in the corner. Lord Jesus. Yep, read. The old man was obviously remembering some very tense and perhaps humorous episodes in the caves. No, he said, now in a voice with a touch of eloquence. Authority from God is not afraid of challenge, challengers, makes no defense, and cares not one whit if it must be dethroned. What, you hear that? Challenges from who? Challenges from who? God. Why is it challenging from God? Because God is always in control. He puts no more on you than you can what? He always makes a way of, a way you get out of it. That way might be painful. But they'll get you out of it. Ask Joseph, was it painful? It was. He said they sold him into slavery. He says that they put shackles on him. He said it bruised his heel. He was bruised in this process of him going to Egypt for whose purpose? For them. He was going to Egypt for him. He was going to Egypt for them. The very people who were selling him into slavery who wanted to kill him. See, that's, the, that, that's real maturity. Can, can, can you go through pain for the folks that want to kill you? And, I, and, and then sometimes I have to really check myself because God always said, okay, you know, you know what the right thing to do. I said, no, I really don't want to do it, God, you know. How, how many of you ever tell God, I want you to, you know, somebody did you wrong and now God wants you to go do something nice for them and you're like, I mean, part of you want to do it, but the other part is saying, maybe, maybe, I, maybe I need another fast before I do it. Maybe maybe maybe, maybe maybe one more prayer meeting before I do this. That's the challenge. Read. That was the greatness of the great, 
of the true king. The old man began to walk away. Both anger and regal patience were evident in his uh, bearing as he turned. Then he faced the youth once more, thundering one last salvo. As far as David's having authority, men who don't have it talk about it all the time. Submit, submit, that's all you hear. David had authority, but I don't think that fact ever occurred to him. We were 600 no goods with a leader who cried a lot. He did what? Cried. He cried a lot. Which means that he had heart. He was compassionate. Now most leaders, if you got 600 men who are a bunch of thieves and no goods and murderers, the last thing you think you should do in front of them is what? Because if you cried, that would make you look what? Weak and soft. So the challenge is, I'm transparent. And how I many know transparency for us is ultimately very dangerous? We hate to really reveal who we are because we think people will use it against us. That's why even in church, you're among your brothers and sisters, but most people are very careful not to really tell their inner feelings. Some people have never really told their true testimonies because they said, if I tell you what I came out of or what I was involved in, you may turn around and do me in with it. But David had a place where his trust was not in man, but his trust was in God. And he realized that ultimately it was God. And, and, and this, when did this start in David? This feeling now that we see him talking, this, this um, elder statesman who was one of David's mighty men. But for David, when did this process start with him? All right, so give, give, you give me a more precise moment. I want a precise moment. I want a precise moment. That's a secondary precise moment. I want a precise moment. Uh, the warmest to me so far is Sister Brown. The, the, the lion and the bear. Because you remember, we, we read this now in the book. He says, and he, as he ran, he ran away from the bear. Huh? He ran where? In direction to the bear. Remember, he was, him, the lamb was in the middle. The bear's running to the lamb. He's running to the lamb. He said, as he took a stone and mended it to his, to his sling, he realized what? He was not afraid. So anytime you're running towards danger and there's no fear in you, you must be trusted who? You, best, you got that right. There's a robbery in the bank and you run into the robber with the gun. I hope you, re I re I hope you really heard from God. <laughs> Even when you run away from the robber, with the gun, you want to make sure you're going through the right door. Or if you reach up and grab the gun when the gun's at your forehead, you would hope like, God is telling me to do this. Because it may not work out too well if it's not. Oh, yes, God, read. Oh, that's all we were. Those were the last words the young soldier heard from the old warrior. Slipping back into the street, he wondered if he would ever again be happy serving under Rehoboam. Which, and who's Rehoboam? That is the grandson of who? Of David. Y'all remember that. That's the grandson of David. Now, I want you to read one more time. What were the last words of this great... Um, David had authority, but I don't think that fact. Yes, nice. David had authority, but I don't think that fact ever occurred to him. Why did it never occur to him? 
He said, David had authority because he was not trying to, wait, wait, from the very offset, did David put these men together in that cave? No. no. How, how did they wind up in the cave? The cave? They were all renegades. They were on their own. So when David, or when they found David, whatever cave, whoever found whoever, what was the one thing David was never trying to do? He was never trying to lead them. They decided to allow him to lead them. So great leaders, you know, Dr. King and those people, though, there's a natural thing when people have a leadership about it. Sometimes people come in, you ever been in a group in a room and one person stands out and all of a sudden, you know, there's a group meeting, but how do, they, how, do they, how do they lead? Some people just have a natural ability to lead. But to lead without legalism, demanding, submit to me. Sometimes it's their own passion or how they see things that kind of brings everybody together. Read it one more time, nice and loud, and we're going to end on this. David had authority, but I don't think that fact ever occurred to him. We were 600 no goods with a leader who cried a lot. That's all we were. Those were the last words the young soldier heard from the old warrior. Slipping back into the street, he wondered if he would ever again be happy serving under Rehoboam. So he said, he said, we were just no goods. He didn't say, we were 600 mighty men of valor. That's not how this guy ended. He said, we were 600 what? No good. Look at somebody say, it's good to be a no good. <laughs> and a, what a, a guy who cried a lot. Does not look like a winning team to me. But it was. All right, let's go to the last chapter in part one. Here we go, y'all. So having come to the end of our study of Saul and David, do you feel greatly assisted? What's that? Oh, what's that? Are you now certain the man you are under is not truly from God? Or if he is, he is at best only a Saul? My, how certain we mortals can be of things even angels do not know. So angels don't even know. Only God knows. Why is it that angels don't know only God knows? Nope. Okay, you said Lord. Okay, but yeah, that's nice, though. Okay, their position, their job. But okay, but why is it? What is it that separates their knowing of a Saul or a David from God's knowing or a Saul or a David? Because that's right. Because the only person that can look into the heart is God. Angels have job, jobs to do. They do it on the outside. God is the only person that has an inner into your And that's why some people, and that's why you have to be very careful when you judge people. You know, I, I don't, I, even when people mess up, you don't know if somebody repented. You know if God took their repentance and you're still holding in your heart something against that person. And God never forgave them and they're on about their business. Tell, tell you, let me see, that's why you got to mind your what? Mind your own business. It's not worried about whether people are right or wrong. Just make sure you're right and wrong. And that's right. And make sure right, you can't be the judge and the jury. God said, how can, you talk, how can you talk about somebody else's situation and you got a two by four in your eye and you want to tell somebody, okay, that don't work. What we should be doing is interceding and praying for one another. Because but for the mercy of God, there go each and every one of us. And that's the God's honest truth. All right, keep going. May I ask you then, what you plan to do with this newly acquired knowledge? Yes, I am aware that you yourself are neither a Saul nor a David, but only a peasant of the realm. You do plan, though, to, sh to share your new discoveries. Sorry. Uh, uh, you do plan, though. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you do plan, though, to share your new discoveries with a few friends. I see then perhaps I should warn you that there is great danger with this heady new knowledge of yours. Okay, what's the heady new knowledge? 
No, what is right, right, that you can judge who's the David and who's the Saul. Touch them and say, how well can you judge? How well do you know who is David and who's Saul? And not only do you know, but you're going to do what with it? Huh? She just read it. You're going to listen. So, so what? Share it with people. So what do we call that? Gossip. So you just, oh, you got this down. God downloaded to you now. I know. I know who Saul is. I know who David is. Now, y'all come. Let me tell y'all. Let me tell you. I know. Do you know? Absolutely not. Only God knows. And for some people, that's very painful. Well, if you go on all of these blogs that are on now, bloggers go on trying to tell you that they know. Did you hear the last dirt? Oh, they're about to they're about to go on there. They and one blogger takes the stuff from another blogger who takes the from another blogger, and they blog the same stuff, and they all like they know what's about to happen, and they don't. But one thing is for sure, God is not mocked. Whatever you sow is coming back home to roost on you. That's why you shut your mouth and stay out of it. Say again. Keep you out of trouble. Yes, ma'am. And if you tell me God told you to say something, you better make sure God's ready to back it up. Okay. Read. That's, oh, I'll give you a quick example. So somebody called me. I don't even know who the, 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 the reverend is, the pastor. So he was on face, one of these books, maybe YouTube or one of them. He was testifying that great, during this Easter uh, vacation, it was going to be like utter turmoil in New York. That, you know, he was packing his bag, and everybody who was in New York should pack out and get out. So I had some people text me, Pastor, did you read that? I said, yeah. I said, what? So they sent me the link. I said, okay. So what you want me to do? I said, I don't really, this is personal. I said, I don't really believe that as being a pastor in New York who prays and fasts, that God will let disaster come to New York without saying to me, hey, John, you need to tell your people to back up. So uh, he can take his bag and go on vacation in Texas where he was going. But I don't think anything like that is going to happen in New York. And sure enough, guess what? It didn't happen in New York. It happened in Texas. Happened in Texas. That's funny. You got jokes. Oh, you. There was a lot of Midwest. Yeah, but New York was pretty good. How I many know there is a remnant in New York? How I many know there is some praying folks in New York? I'm not saying the devil didn't want to do something, but tell you that he couldn't do it. He said he left a very little remnant. Full of power. Look at this. We full of power. It's not about how many people you got. It's how many people that have power. Who have faith to believe the word of God and stand on that word. We will not operate in fear. We will operate in the knowledge and the wisdom of God. Read, recorder. A strange mutation can take place within your own heart. Mutation means your heart changes. That's why you got to be careful who speaks to you. Because words are what? Words are what? Yes, there's life and death in words, but what are words? Breathe, John, breathe. Why, Lord, why? I try so hard, God. Words are what? She rolls over the chair. Word, you know, I taught y'all this. Oh, they are that too. Yes, they are. Y'all hopping all the way around. I'm not saying you're wrong in what you say, but you ain't looking for what I'm saying. The most powerful things words are, words are what? And I, I told you, well, I taught you it. Many times, I show, I show, I, we said that, I, I, analysis, I gave you a, a, an analysis of what it was. There's seeds. 
See, you must, you must see words as seed. Why? Because, because what happens to words when they're not in the right environment, then what happens to them? No, no, listen to me. Listen, this is important. You're online. I want to put the chat out. When words are not in the right environment, what happens to them? Nothing. Everybody say nothing. So people say something to you, if you can keep the environment right in your heart, nothing happens. But if you take seeds and put them in the right environment, what's going to happen? They're going to grow and develop. And you can have two kinds of fruit. What kind of two fruits you can have? Good fruit, bad fruit. So you got to be careful when you get in conversation with people. Brother, you know that they're dropping seeds right inside your heart. And then the devil will set you up, let you hear something. That's what I would people, I, I knew some people who were just, for a while, everything that was going online, they were watching every night, hours watching. Then they went to, you know, do you know, John, you know, listen, listen, I ain't got time. Then they get irritated. Oh, you want to talk to me? Listen, no, I don't. That's junk. It's seeds. I don't need that in my spirit. I don't need that mess in my spirit because then the devil set me up, get me in the wrong environment. All of a sudden, this stuff starts coming up inside of me. I don't need it. Tell you them, say, I don't need it. So words are seed. And so you said that seed is sharper than a two-edged sword. You, you get cut up from the inside. You bleed out. It's life and death. So they, they, they're just little seeds, but I'm in the grow up and they'll kill you. So you have to be careful. Read, recorder. You see, it is possible, but wait. What is it I see over there? There. In that distant mist behind you, turn. Do you see? Who is that figure making his way through the fog? It seems I have surely seen, seen him before. Look closely. Is it not possible for us to make out what he is doing? He appears to be bending over some ancient chest. Yes, he has opened it. Who is he and what is he doing? He has taken something out of the chest, a cloak. It is some kind of cape. Why, he is putting it on. The thing fits him perfectly. So now you got the picture down. So we're all sitting here. You're looking out. It's really the fog. is really thick. You ever see the fog in the evening? You can barely, or early morning, you can barely see through it. And we just see an image. We can't make out who it is. And there's this big chest. And he's bending over the chest. He's opening up the chest. And he's pulling out something. Well, it looks like. A cape, and he swings the cape, and he's putting the cape on. But we don't know who it is yet. So is this mystery? Who, who is this? What is this cape? Read. Uh, the thing fits him perfectly, falling about his shoulders like a mantle. Now what? He reaches again into that chest. I know I have seen that person somewhere before. What is it he pulls forth this time? A shield? No, a coat of arms. Or a coat of arms. What is a coat of arms? It's, it's, not, a, it's not a coat with a lot of arms in it. It's a symbol. It is a symbol of, of what? No, it's like armor. Like sometimes you can find a coat of arms on a shield. You can find it on a material. What does a coat of arms represent? A, yes, authority would be one of the things it represents. A kingdom. A institution. Okay, you know, you know, we in the Pentecostal church, you'll see some people have on those robes and they have the um, shawls in the front. You see these images and some of them like coats of arms. Because they represent their religious affiliation, their organization. Read. Yes, a coat of arms from some ancient, long-forgotten order. He holds it up as one who would, make, who would make that order his own. Who is that man? The bearing, the stance, the carriage. I've seen it before, I'm sure. Ah, he has moved out of the mist into the light. We will see him clearly now. That face, is it not you? Yes, it is. It is you. Wait a minute. It's not who? You. Who's you? Who's you? Me, you. you, you say, it's me. 
Everybody look at, look at somebody and say, that's me. We've been talking about you this whole time right now. This is you. You've, you've moved out of the mist. You've now into the light. We see it's you. It's Jackie and Jackie. It's Ennis and Lita and Brown. It's Ann. It's Keisha. It's you. Oh my God, it's you. So what is you doing? Read. You? You who can so wisely discern the presence of an unworthy soul. Oh wow, you, have, what discernment? All y'all got discernment power. You can discern who the unworthy soul is. You better go ahead with your bad self. Go ahead, go read. Go, look in yon mirror. That man is you. Look to at the name upon that coat of arms. Behold, Absalom the second. Hello, tell your name, say your new name is Absalom the second. So if you're the second, what's that's very important for us to now find out? Who was the first? And why do we need to find out who the first is? So we know what? All right, so yeah, yeah, but you said it kind of reversed. So it's important us for us to know who the first is. Why? <laughs> he's here. No, he's here. He ain't coming. He's here. What, what do we want to know about the first? What do we want to know about the first? Yes, his character. If you're the second, you want to know, well, this is what I came out of. What's, who your mama? Who your daddy? You ever you hear, my, I hear wives tell the kids, you just like your mama. You just like your daddy. You look just like them. <laughs> so, yeah, who, 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 are, who are you? Who are you? Is there more? That's it. So we're getting ready. We'll, we'll, next week, we will move to part two. Who are you? Actually, let me say, who are you? That's going to be the question. Now, I want to move over for a minute. This could help you. Reader, you're going to the book of Genesis. You're going to Genesis 45, 7 through 11. Message, if you can do it for me. Want to read? Read. Okay, listen up now. So we ain't got much time. I got about 15 minutes and that's it. Okay, go. Come closer to me, Joseph said to his brothers. Come closer to me. They came closer. I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. So if, if you were one of the brothers and he told you those words, what, what would you look like? A ghost. Yeah, you said it right. Turn absolutely white. A white. No, they probably weren't white. They probably was black. Turn absolutely white. Lost all their color in their face. Why would they do that? Because first they thought he was dead. Now he's not even dead. What is he? He's alive and he is? He's in charge. Which means what might now happen? The story is about to change. Now maybe they're about to get their heads cut off. Maybe they're about to get thrown in jail. But of course we've been reading about this heart that David possessed. We heard about what real leadership is. So let's talk about what happens with Joseph. Now we're, we're running parallel. David, Joseph, read. But don't feel badly. Don't blame yourselves for selling me. Whoa, what? Now, for him to say that means that he didn't know, he no longer had what in him? Anger, what else, Corey? Revenge. Tell your neighbor, let it go. I know people in Christendom 
who can't let it go, who constantly bring up the past. How many of you realize that if you ever drive a car and while you're driving, you always look in the rear view mirror while you're driving, what is destined to happen? You're going to have an accident. When you go through life and you could keep looking behind you, your life, your life is about to have an accident. See, why? that's why it's important to realize what David realized that who's ultimately in control? God. So whatever happens to you, you don't have to be vengeful. You don't have to get back at nobody. You know what? God allowed it to happen. I'm going to learn from, from what the situation is. I'll be more prayerful. I'll be more consecrated. But I'm not going to let you ruin my future. And let me tell you something. Don't let nobody fool you. If you walk around with unforgiveness and bitterness in your heart, you're allowing that situation to ruin your future. There is no way around that. And I know some folks who are just, they're determined to ruin their future. They're determined. I, and, 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 and I got to tell you, you can lie to your own self. When you forgive somebody, what do you ultimately have to do? Forget. You got to let it go. I hear people say, I'll forgive you. I'll never forget. No, you're playing a game with yourself. Because people are filled with triggers. Some of y'all got triggers. Somebody say a certain way, something like you, man, that, that'll send you into the war zone. Yeah, my, my, my ex used to do that. or My father did that. or Because you haven't gotten over it yet. That's why there's a lot of saints that need some therapy. No, they need to go sit down with somebody on a couch and talk to them. You need to get all that stuff that's in you out of you because it's all bottled up. And when somebody says something, you explode. My father used to use this illustration. He says, people are filled with scabs. You know, you ever scrape your hand and you get a scab. Now, the job of the scab, when it begins to heal, it gets what? Hard. Dry hard. And that's so that no, no dirt, nothing can get it. It covers it. But if you hit that hand, it does what? It knocks the scab off and it starts to bleed. There are people every day who get their scabs knocked off. you got so many bleeding Christians because they just won't get healed. You, look at someone and say, you got to get healed. So sometimes you got to just talk it out and then got to let it go. Read, my dear. God was behind it. Who was behind it? Now look at somebody say, God is behind it all. Right? Said David said, it's up to God. What he does, what God's in control. He's behind it. How many of y'all trust God to that point that he's behind it all? That, let me tell you, that's a real place of faith. When you come to the place of, hey, this man just said, when I had my, when my, my father made me a mini coat of color, a coat of many colors, he was, God was behind it. I'll try that again. When my father made me a coat of many colors, God was, you're getting it, okay. When I had the dreams about my brothers bowing down before me, God was. When my brothers became jealous of me because of the love of my father, God was. When, when my father sent me out to check on my brothers. No, no. When my brothers became very jealous of me to the point of wanting to kill me, God was. Now, some people say, Pastor, you're you off track. No, God was behind it. When my brother saw me and threw me in a pit, God was. Wow. When they, put, when they were about to murder me and kill me, God was. When we saw my cousin, the Ishmaelites, coming and they sold me into slavery, God was. When they took me into Egypt and sold me to Potiphar and I made him a rich man, God was. And when his wife accused me of rape, God was. 
And when they threw me in jail, God was. And when the butler and the baker initially forgot all about me, God was. I can't hear y'all. And when the king had a dream and nobody else could interpret it, God was. And when I was the only one that could do it, God was. Tell you them say, God's always where? All of that behind it. But when it, but you can't see it. Faith is not what I see, faith is what I want. So what I believe is in the faithfulness of God. How many believe he's a faithful God? Don't always understand his decisions. But what I knew what I do know about him that he is faithful. Read. God sent me here ahead of you to save lives. God sent me here ahead of you to save your life. Go ahead, read. There has been a famine in the land now for two years. The famine will continue for five more years. Now, wait a minute. How does Joseph know there's a famine in the land for those five years? Told him when? In the dream. Because God was right. Read. Neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me on ahead to pave the way and make sure there was a remnant in the land to save your lives in an amazing act of deliverance. So I, God sent me here. God sent me here to save the lives of the people that wanted to kill me. Look at what I say. Can you go ahead? Of somebody who wants to kill you to suffer to save their life. It's a lot to think about. It's one thing to read it. It's another thing to act it out. Because this is not, we're reading it this very quickly. But this is days, weeks, months, imprisonment. All the time, years, to think about what somebody's done to you and yet to keep releasing it. Read. So you see, it wasn't you who sent me here, but God. He set me in a place as a father to Pharaoh, put me in charge of his personal affairs, and made me ruler of all Egypt. He said God, God was the one that gave me favor with Pharaoh. Now, you're going to use my favor to save your no good lives. Yep. Read. Hurry back to my father. Tell him, your son Joseph says, I'm master of all Egypt. Come as fast as you can and join me here. I'll give you a place to live in Goshen where you'll be close to me, you, your children, your grandchildren, your flocks, your herds, and anything else you can think of. Go read one more right there. I'll take care of you there completely. There are still five more years of famine ahead. I'll make sure all your needs are taken care of, you and everyone connected with you. You won't want for a thing. How do you think his brothers feel now? Shame, low, regretful, or, or they also might feel very grateful. grateful. They, they might be looking at you big dummy. I told you you shouldn't have killed him. <laughs> Worry about his daggone coat. That was a beautiful coat he had on. <laughs> you know, how many of you know you can flip the script? I never hated him at all. I really liked the boy personally. <laughs> When he had that dream about bowing down, I was already on my knees bowing down to him. I think it was, it was always something about him, you know, that I just, I was trying to explain, you know, y'all just misunderstood my emotions about him. Oh, yeah. My, my I did not to kill him. Yes. Listen to me. No matter what the devil's trying to do, it never overrules God. God said, I, God said, I put no more on you than you can bear. So whatever's on you, even if he allows access of the enemy 
and cannot destroy you because he's in control. Okay. I mean, and again, I have to be a living example of the words. There's enough in my life that I should not be sitting here having this conversation with you. There's just no way. And I, sometimes I have to sit there and think of my own self, you know, just what other people have gone through, me being a part of wheelchair charities and watching hundreds of gunshot people who are crippled from their neck down. And when you have a nine millimeter sitting in the front of your head, I can feel the cold in my head to this day. Or I can feel the, when the guy took the soft shotgun and, and ram it up in the middle of my back. If he had a shot that I would have been crippled for, besides being dead, if I had lived, I would have been crippled for life. I mean, his, his fingers on the trigger, they trying to get out. They got a couple hundred thousand dollars of the city's money from the, from the um, motor vehicle office. They had sacks of money. All I know is thank God for the blood. Thank God for the blood. And so you just realize that the devil has power, but he's not more powerful than God. And then also, you're a child of God. You know, you, you're not outside. You, 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 you're, you're in the ark of protection with God. You're his daughter. You're his child. And so the word, and then you're blessed. Tell you, you're blessed. That's why I'm obsessed with people always want to go to somewhere and get a blessing. I'm going to this revival, Pastor. I'm going to need a blessing. You're so crazy. Why are you going somewhere? You know why you're going somewhere? Because you don't know what you are. You have an identity crisis. If I know the Bible says we are the spiritual seed. Here we back to the word. I am the spiritual seed of Abraham. And whatever blessing is on Abraham is on me. To tell your neighbor, we're already blessed. What we need to do is operate in the blessing. That's what we don't do. We're not faithful to the blessing. We don't acknowledge God enough about we reason before you do anything, acknowledge me first. We, we, we do what we want first, and then we want to acknowledge God when it don't work out. So let me give you this. Okay, do you know that there is a place where you can experience prosperity in the midst of crisis? There you go, Jackie. Prosperity in the midst of crisis. This place is known as Goshen. Now, everybody look at someone and say, I live in Goshen. My address in my house is 53 St. Paul's Road North, Hempstead, New York, 11550. <laughs> Say what? Yeah, I was. Okay, now watch. But I don't live there. I live in Goshen. I don't care what your address is. Tell someone about I live in Goshen. Because Goshen is not just a place. Goshen is a state of mind. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Call those things that be not as though they pass tense. Tell somebody, look at this and say, I live in Goshen. Why? Because you have to understand the power of what Goshen is. Okay. Goshen means drawing near. So you should write this down. You have paper. Goshen means drawing near or the best of the land. Slap somebody in the high five and say, I live in the best of the land. I don't care you live in Queens Village, South Bronx, Bed-Stuy. Tell you to say, I live in the best of the land. Goshen has become synonymous with a place of comfort and plenty. Tell you to say, I live in a place of comfort. I live in a place of plenty. Faith is not what I see. Faith is what I what? Believe. Many times God allows you to start in one place. Because remember, it, um, Israel was where? Where, where, where? where were the children of Israel at? Prophet Jones taught this Sunday morning. See, see how important it is to take notes and learn? And he just said that. If you don't take notes, you'll wind up forgetting what I'm teaching you. Where were the children of Israel? Where, did, where were they coming from? So let, we're going to do that in a minute. We'll leave it, leave it, leave it. Let's leave it. So. 
say, yes, Canaan. They, they came from Canaan. To where? To Goshen. Everybody said they came to Goshen. They came to Canaan because Canaan had become the place of what? Why? Famine. There was a, now a big famine that was in, the, in Canaan, and they came to buy from Egypt because Egypt had all the stuff because of who? Because of Joseph. Genesis 4, 47 and 11 says what? We're closing. I got two minutes. <clears throat> Forty-seven and eleven. <laughs> Forty-seven and eleven. Read um, any version. <laughs> and Joseph placed his father and his brethren, and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land. Now wait, he took them out of Canaan. To where? And put them where? In the best of the land. In where? Egypt. No, in Egypt. Read, you listen, y'all listen, in Egypt. What is Egypt a type of? The world. How many know God will give you favor in the world? When you are that child of God who walks in obedience and not rebellion, God will give you favor. In the land of Egypt. Read. In the land of Ramesses, as Pharaoh has com had commanded. And Joseph nourished his father and his brethren and all his father's household with bread according to their families. And gave them bread. Gave them eat in the middle of a famine. Read. And there was no bread in all the land. For the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the corn which they bought. And Joseph bought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said... All the Egyptians came unto who? Joseph. The whole world was coming to who? Joseph. Joseph, the rapist. Joseph, the fugitive. Joseph, the criminal. I don't care what the world calls you. Who's behind it? And, how many, and God can flip the script in a moment. Tell you, let me say, I live in Goshen, and the best is yet to come. All right, close your Bible. We got to stop right there. I'll finish this between Friday and Sunday. But I'm sure you learned a lot tonight. And we have moved into some powerful teaching next week on Epsilon. Because who are you? No, no, you Epsilon number two. I got to look, I got to watch out for you. Touch your neighbor, say neighbor. neighbor. Say it nice and loud. Say neighbor. neighbor. You're Epsilon too. I got to look out for you. Yeah, you dangerous. I got to watch my back now. And the second part, where y'all live at? Where's your, where do you live? Tell somebody I live in Goshen. I'm going to get some shirts say I live in Goshen. Goshen is a state of mind. Sister Lita, you will be my, my, thank you very much. Put an envelope in everybody's hand. Goshen demands everybody to saw a, a seat of grace. If you get to Goshen, you got to have a seat of grace. Everybody saw a $50 seat tonight. You online, we had about 33 people. Is that a current number, Corey, online? Corey, you gave me a, a, a straight numbers. Is Corey back there? Where is he at? Corey. Corey, you can't work outside the door, son. 
I want a current number. Is that number right online? And I need to put up how to give online. So you, and so you can even feel that when it comes to David. Because David was in a cave with 600 what? No goods. Thieves and murderers. But who was behind it? Because if you if you if you, if you a big crybaby, just an irrational thinking, you think about if a dude is a big crybaby, you'd call him a what? That's nice. What else? How about a sissy? He ain't nothing but a sissy. All you tell me is cry. Why would I want him to lead me? Because God was behind it. Bless you. Ooh, I felt the God in that home. I so. You're online tonight. I want everybody to saw a fifty dollars. This is a seat of grace. You are graced to live in Goshen. You are graced. I don't know if Katrina's living. I mean, if she's online, she tell me, Pastor, I'm going to Goshen. Yeah, in New York, there's a place called Goshen, New York. Maybe we should buy some acres of land and build some houses up in Goshen. Could you, could you put Howley Give Up? Thank you, I Dolly, for that salsa. Dolly went all the way to Paris and came back to France. I thought she was going to take me with me when she left me in New York. I was practicing my French, polyvue Francais, and that's wee oui, wee. Oui. Then I, I said, where was I? Oh, they left this morning on the flight. They, they left me here. <laughs> Hold that seat up. Lord, we thank you now for every seed being sowed. Thank you for all those online who are being obedient to sow that $50 grace. It's a, it's a seed of grace. You want to sow that this time. And if you can't, you want to sow the closest thing you have to it. I promise you, it's going to bless your life. We're living in a new place. Y'all, we let all move. We all living in Goshen together. Place of comfort, place of plenty. It's the blessed land. It's the blessed place. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Come drop your seed in. So good to see all your smiling faces. Now, you don't want to miss Friday night because Friday night we're going to be in Goshen for sure. I'm going to really unwrap Goshen on Friday night. Now, remember, you can, you want to pass it around? Okay, everybody. Um, now, this coming Saturday, I need as many of you. Now, if you work, work with Sister Lorraine or you help in the kitchen, please reach out to Sister Lorraine. But Sister Michelle Brown passed. You all may know Sister Michelle Brown. She was the one in the wheelchair. Used to be always out by the door. A loving person. A giving person. Always had a word. Even when she was going through, she never, all she had something positive. Okay, what she was going through, she was battling hard with diabetes. And, you know, sometimes that's a very difficult situation. But she tried to stay positive, always had positive things to say. No matter what, whenever I saw her, she always had something good to say. Anybody back there? Yes? Okay, so let me pray for it. In the name of Jesus, okay. So we're, you know, we're sad to say that God saw fit to transition her out of this place. Um, but her homegoing service is going to be on this coming um, Saturday morning, Saturday morning, 10 o'clock. We do want as many of you reach out to people. We want to be here. We want to be here to celebrate a person's life. And here's a person that was not out front a lot, but she was big in the back. <laughs> you know, her spirit was just big, always a smile, always had something good to say. She just was. That was her. 
and she's going to be really, really missed. Really missed. So we, we're asking everybody to please, missionaries, ushers, everybody, y'all know, reach out, help pass, get the word out. Let's show up for the family. Now also, the time, 10 o'clock, 10 a.m. And also on Friday night, I'm going to take an offering for the family. Again, there was some situation where insurances weren't in place. And we just want to try to help them. Now, there is going to be a repass, which we're going to take care of for the church. We'll take to try to take some of the expense off the family. So they're going to have the service and the repass here on Saturday. And then the burial will be Monday in New Jersey. So I'll be going with the family on Monday in New Jersey for the burial service. So let's keep them in prayer. And then don't forget uh, uh, Brother Kareem's mother. That's going to be on Friday the 26th in the morning. 9 to 10 is the wait. 10 o'clock will be the service. And she'll be going to Pine Lawn. Again, Sister Sinclair was a wonderful woman, always with a smile, always a positive something to say. And this is teaching you, tomorrow's not promised to anybody. How many of you thank God for your life, your health, and your strength? So we want to be there for uh, Brother McFarland. He's been so faithful to our ministry, faithful to your pastor, I'll tell you. If that's one faithful brother that's still with Pastor Boy, it has been him since I've been pastoring. And so we want to be here to support that family. Uh, that repast will not be here. It will be uh, at another location. Okay, all minds clear. We are two minutes, three minutes to nine. Everybody stay on your feet. Good timing. Good teach. Tell you if they go home and study. Can y'all put your hands together for my reader? She reading better and better. <laughs> oh, my God. Lord, we thank you for all these smiling faces. We thank you for the process that you have us all in. And God, as we are using David's life to learn about the proper positioning and how, God, you are ultimately always in control. You were in control in David's life. You were in control in Joseph's life. And for both of these men, they had crucial times where death was all around them. But, God, you were behind it all. And no matter what the devil has, we know we are more than conquerors. And we say it, but we know this, that no weapon that is formed against us has the ability to prosper or to take over or to take effect. Because, Lord, we are covered in the favor of God. We're covered in the blood of God. And, God, we are covered by your angels. God, you've been faithful to us. You're teaching us how to trust you. No matter what it looks like, we know you're behind it all. And God, we just thank you for what you're doing internally in our lives. Not only in this room, but those who are online, God. You're bringing about change in us. We will not be the same men, women, boys, and girls. But our thinking is changing, God. Because you have a new place to bring us to. Pray for Sister Lisa. We rebuke every spirit of infirmity and sickness. We pray for Sister Brown's family, Sister Michelle Brown. Brother McFarland's family, we pray for both families. We ask you to strengthen them. We, ask, we keep Sister Marlene and her family in prayer. God, we thank you because you are covering over us all. Now as we are set to leave from this place but never from your presence, go with us, watch over us, and keep us as only you can until we come again. People of God lifted their voices and declared with authority in the atmosphere, I am, I am. what the word Says I am, somebody shout I am living in Goshen.